Hello everyone, this is Ricardo from Military History of Macau. Today I am in the Gia Hill. You can see the uh, chapel and the, the lighthouse here in the Gia Hill. I have a beautiful view of Macau uh, from here, from the top of the, uh, the old fortress, the 17th century fortress. However, in, in this video I'm going to be talking about the uh, more recent fortifications that were built here in the Gia Hill in more, more accurately in the 20th century. Uh, there, it's a video that I have been uh, wishing to make for a long time. Um, if you search online, etc., there's not much information about uh, what these fortifications are in the, the more recent fortifications here in the Gia Hill. And I, I wish this can be a very uh, can be an educational video and can you and and I can uh, help other people understand better the um, the little uh, hints of military heritage that still exist here in the Gia Hill. So stick around. I'm gonna have a lot of fun making this video. So we'll see ya. By the 19th century. The, uh, the, the garrison here in Macau is in a state of, uh, it's very much outdated. Um, and that includes the fortresses here uh, in the territory. Uh, almost all of them by then, by the late 19th century, are, are from our heritage, uh, were built in 17th century. And that's why in some ways they're actually considered heritage not exactly a, a fortress that is worthy of placing uh, uh, weapons on, given the, how old and how thoroughly obsolete these fortifications are by the 19th century. Um, the only, uh, for example, the Gia Hill where I am today is a great example. It's built in the, in the first half of the 17th century, and so it is built for 17th century warfare. Um, it, it does not take into account the massive uh, uh, technological advancements that happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the later in the Industrial Revolution. And so by the 19th century, most of the fortresses here in, in Macau are just thoroughly obsolete. Uh, the only zones, some exceptions of newer fortifications, we have the Mongha Hill further north and Dona Maria, so on the other side of the Gia Hill, uh, on a little little out, outcrop that is called Dona Maria. Uh, many people may know it from the Dona Maria Bend from the Macau Grand Prix, for example. There's a little fort there. And the more recent one in 1874 is the 1st of December Battery named such because of the, uh, the restoration of independence from Portugal, the, where Portugal left the Iberian Union in the 1st of December, in, uh, 1st of December 1640. So it, it was given that name to commemorate. And it was located on the south part of, of, the, of the peninsula, close to where today is the headquarters of the security forces of, of Macau. Uh, and very, very close to where today is the Grand Lisboa. So all of that area has been landfilled, and so the, that, that old 1st December battery uh, was demolished. However, let's go back to the 19th century. Uh, from the get-go, it was built uh, as a temporary measure from, from what it seems to be patterned in the archives. Um, however, uh, some years later, the other officers that came to Macau um, gave a very damning report to this newer fortification. Um, and uh, given that it was considered that the profile of this battery was completely unacceptable. And uh, in that report, it's considered to be better just to uh, leave uh, all of the fortresses, these old 17th century fortresses, without any weaponry, whether it's the Mont Fortress. Uh, even the Mont Fortress is considered, um, it's useful, but it should not be the place where uh, artillery should be positioned. 
it doesn't have the conditions for such or the modern conditions considered for such and also the uh, the first december battery the bar uh, battery for example all of these older fortresses are considered just best to uh, lead, uh, to uh, re uh, remove all artillery from these uh, uh, fortresses and so we're going to see then what is the one of the most crucial periods that determines the uh, pre 20th century uh, layout of the garrison here in Macau. Um, this is a very important report that has very advanced ideas that would be later applied in Macau 30 years later. It, in this case is the uh, chief of staff at that time, uh, Eduardo Augusto March, and he later would be returning to Macau. Uh, so this is 1899 that he's a chief of staff, and then later, 10 years later, in 1909, He's back in Macau as the governor. But let's go back to 1899. Eduardo Augusto March has a very, um, uh, very thought-provoking report in, in that he argues that all of these old fortresses should be, um, all uh, the garrison should uh, leave these fortresses, these older 17th century fortresses, and in many cases preserve them as antiquities or to simply bulldoze them and build on, 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 on those spots in more modern fortifications. Uh, he lays out a plan of having just three fortifications so that the garrison focuses on three main fortifications and from there they can have a very um, more efficient way of protecting the, the Maca Macau Peninsula and in, in the Macau territory in general. Um, he argues that and some of these ideas would actually come to fruition more than 30 years later after he puts out. So it's a very advanced um, uh, thinking for, for the time, for 1899 as some of these ideas really materialized m uh, much, much later. Uh, so he argues three main fortifications. Uh, one of them is in the south, so by deactivating the Bar Fortress, he considers that it's more important to have on the, on the top of the hill of the Bar um, uh, uh, Hill, the Makoksan, he considers it's more important to have a, a battery on top of that fort, on top of that hill. Um, he argues that, for example, Mong Ha should be rebuilt. So, the, what exists, the, the the fortification from the 1860s that exists there, should be bulldozed, and a new fortification should be built on top of it. And actually, it's true. 25 years later, after he writes this report, that's exactly what happened in Mong Ha. But much, much earlier, uh, and so that's the second one. And uh, uh, the, the third fortification that he argues is a much more ad advantageous position to have a modern fortification is the crest, the top of the crest of the Gia Hill. So therefore, leaving, uh, removing all artillery or main, uh, main force of the garrison remove them from these old fortresses and place them in these three spots uh, uh, and, and considered more um, important for him is the, the, the priority we could say is actually the Gia Hill. He argues and he calls it uh, from the south the Bar Fortress called Batria de Ponta de Macau. He calls it like that um, and but here in the Gia Hill he calls it a Batria Alto the Flora, which means the, the um, battery from the Flora Peak, or so in the in the area of this the mid ridge of the um, the Gia Hill where it, it has its highest point outside of here of these this old um, 17th century fortresses. So the the garrison that would be positioned here by the late 19th century would then move to this more modern. Um, uh, uh, to the, the more modern facilities. And for example, he gives an example. 
there is a great that there for example let's going back to this the, the, the first of December battery the battery that it, it, everyone is unsatisfied with he argues that if all of the guns the main guns that were positioned there some um, uh, 176 uh, millimeter Armstrong guns that are rifled uh, muzzle loaders so from the mid 19th century so it already has the uh, some incorporation of some uh, technological advancements that come from the industrial revolution precision and rifling but they're still muzzle loaders and uh, and they're it's not quick firing is still re it requires a lot of time um, to between between sh between uh, between shots he argues that if those guns that are positioned there would all shoot at the same time it would create so much um, uh, uh, vibrations that the headquarters which is located very very close nearby would all basically all of the windows in the headquarters would be shattered given the so much vibrations would come from shooting all of that artillery so nobody is happy with the uh, with the with the guns being positioned there so the priority is given to the gear in the gear hill um, so Eduardo Augusto Marques uh, leaves the recommendation as such and in fact the uh, first, the, uh, at that time, the, uh, the garrison has, um, uh, in, in this case, the Portuguese army and the Portuguese navy equipped themselves with a lot of Krupp guns. And uh, from 1878, 1886, in 1902. So in three occasions, the, uh, the, garrison, the, the Portuguese army and the Portuguese navy equipped themselves with the German guns from the Krupp. Group uh, manufacturer, um, and so uh, the, the Macau government requests or purchases uh, from the from the uh, central government in Portugal two Krupp guns, uh, uh, 15 centimeters, so medium caliber, that were part of the recommendations from Eduardo Augusto Marques. Uh, Eduardo Augusto Marques gives the recommendation also from a much bigger, the 28 centimeter uh, howitzer that also. The Portuguese army had had these howitzers for coastal defense, uh, but they were very expensive. And so Eduardo Augusto Marques gives the recommendation of equipping with the uh, 15 centimeter medium caliber medium caliber guns. And actually, some ships uh, uh, cruiser, the Adamastur, had in its bow and stern um, two of this uh, medium caliber guns. The, um, 15 centimeter uh, Rink Cannon um, L30. So two of those guns came to Macau in December of 1901 aboard the, the vessel Africa. And so uh, in December 1901, the, gar the garrison has two new, more modern, um, for the first time, more modern uh, artillery at its disposal. And following the principle that Eduardo Augusto Marques set and it gives the indication to what what should be uh, the next step uh, but that step uh, he's no longer here and actually is the governor Orti Costa that gives the, the the green light for the creation of the military engineering inspection Inspeção de Engenharia Militar um, that has some collaboration with uh, Cesar W which was the engineer of the Public Works Bureau at that time. However, who is actually responsible for, uh, for, the, for the design and for creating these um, gun emplacements on the top of the Gia Hill, according to the principles that Eduardo Augusto Marques has uh, put forward, is an artillery officer that was here in Macau at that time, Alfredo José Durão. Here is his picture. Um, and it's, it's, it's him that actually uh, puts forward the, the, uh, the, the creations. Uh, he's the one that basically carries out the duty to make it happen. Um, however, we, as I'm going to explore further in this video, is that there's um, hardly any um, hints of today, if we would go and come and see to the, to the gear hill, 
there's not much indications of what existed here before because most of these um, early works done, fortification works done here in the Kia Hill have been over, uh, have been uh, demolished and on top of them newer fortifications have been built. This is part of one of the uh, complex uh, things about the Gia Hill. The fortifications here um, in the Gia Hill is that it's a very complex timeline as fortifications have been built over, uh, we're talking about a 50 year span, uh, a span of 50 years and so it's there's a lot of complex um, uh, mutations over time. Today we cannot see the, these um, these uh, f the fortifications that were built very, very early on in the 20th century. But in a report uh, 10 years later, from uh, around 10 years later, 1916, um, because the, the, these guns, uh, the gun emplacements were finished in 1904, that's when the guns um, uh, were operational. Um, there's not much hint, but there's a report from 1916 that gives us a hint of what these guns were. Um, so, in it out, I've been I've translated into into English from Portuguese to English. Is two pieces AE so uh, aço estriado that means steel rifled uh, material 15 centimeters MK so Krupp material material Krupp and 30 calibers mounted on the gear hill in naval mountings of quick targeting shooting a 51 kilograms projectile with a load of between 15 and 16 kilograms of prismatic gunpowder. The disposition of the mountings of these guns don't allow them to shoot beyond 9,000 meters with the maximum load, even though its maximum range, range well exceeds this distance. The mountings have shields with a thickness of 0.04 in its cylindrical part and 0.025 in its flat part that protect personnel and the more delicate parts of the mountings against shrapnel of small caliber projectiles. The firing range of these, of these pieces is of around 300 degrees and have 431 rounds at their disposal. Um, this is a description of the gun since we cannot see them today. Um, however, uh, there is a map from uh, much, much later in 1921 that gives us the location of these two uh, artillery positions on the top of the gear hill, and we can see from the from the from the from the from the map, we can see those two circular um, uh, structures right next to the barracks, which is the building that is uh, south, um, southward, a little bit south down here, and. Uh, these are the original 1904. Um, however, today there are uh, there's a gun emplacement over there. However, it's debatable whether or not it is the original um, uh, gun emplacement built in 1904, or has it been completely been rebuilt um, in the, in subse subsequent uh, fortification works. So it's. It's, um, it's difficult to know for sure if it is or not an original 1904 construction that we can still see there. What is more interesting about the, these, the, the constructions uh, that, were built, uh, that were done in uh, 1904 is the trend that they, uh, this, this fortification work signal. And that is of a modernization of the garrison and also the philosophy, we could say the uh, adaptation of the garrison into modern warfare. Um, it starts quite, quite late here in Macau. After all, it was a garrison that was, um, it had, it was, it was a small, small garrison by um, 19, 1899, the time that the report was uh, written by Eduardo Augusto Marques um, was, no more than uh, it, it wasn't even more than 600. It was it, it always fluctuated around 570 men, uh, uh, officers, sergeants, and soldiers. So it was a very small garrison. It had um, funding issues, as the Macau government was solely responsible for funding 
the, the defensive, um, uh, for funding the military garrison, for fulfilling its defensive, military defense um, duties, it relied on itself. That was a principle that the Portuguese government always had, is that each colony had to uh, fend for themselves in a certain way. They had to come up with enough uh, funding on their own to fulfill those requirements of military, of being able to at least have a military presence in the, in the colony. And that applied to Angola, that applied to Mozambique, Portuguese India, uh, East Timor, for example. So each, so defensive um, capabilities varied, varied widely across the whole uh, Portuguese overseas um, uh, provinces or colonies. Uh, in here in Macau, it was um, fairly small um, and it had very limited fundings on how it could go about fulfilling that, those, that mission uh, of military defending the territory. And so, what is more important about these uh, uh, fortifications built in 1904 is that it marks a departure, a modernization of the garrison uh, in keeping up with the times. At the time most of these um, uh, the guns here in Macau w were these iron muzzleloaders, about a hundred. Um, and, and this marks a very um, quick departure as in 19, uh, 1899 or before 1899, a hundred of these um, iron muzzle loaders that are not rifled etc this is the uh, uh, is already uh, sailing age of the sail uh, technology is no longer um, uh, deemed military useful or capable military to put being put into active service um, and this creates the whole the whole difference is the arrival of these two guns these two ring cannon um, croup guns uh, mark the departure of the usefulness of these guns as those modern uh, guns could um, fire much more accurately than this could, m much more, much uh, at a longer range, much further away, hit targets much further away um, than these could and also the, they were a quick firing, they were breech loaders, in the case this is a gun, so it's a muzzle loader in which you have to put the gunpowder, the, uh, the, the artillery shell, etc. through the muzzle that is right here in the front part. So by having a breech loading gun, which the Krupp guns are, the modern, modern breech loading, breech loading guns, that's, that is the artillery shell comes through here and the whole process of reloading uh, uh, the gun is much much quicker and therefore you can in one minute space of one minute you can have more artillery shells flying against whoever is your target um, and so in just one year with the arrival of these uh, Krupp guns these all of these guns that were here in Macau these iron old iron muzzle loaders were completely disregarded for active military service so it's an important part of the transition of the garrison into modern warfare. So coming through a path in the forest here in Hongsan, in the Gia Hill, we see what the place where one of the original 1904 Krupp guns was um, located. This is the emplacement, however, as I stressed, just earlier, it is debatable whether or not this gun emplacement looks the same way as it does in 1904 because in later years, in the 1920s, there were uh, reconstruction works done here in the Gear Hill, profound, profound works um, done that substantially changed the, 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 the facilities that were here. It is debatable or not whether or not this kind of garrison, uh, this gun emplacement was already here, as we can see in the maps 
um, if I put on a map for example I am right here if I'm for example in this spot here I will then now show you in a map where I am located so I am fairly over here and as we, we recall the uh, the remains of the gun emplacement the circular gun emplacement as we, we, we recall from the uh, from the, the description made in 1916 about this gun emplacements is that the ga the Krupp guns had a range of a uh, horizontal range of 300 degrees so almost a uh, complete uh, circular 360 not three the full uh, 300 but almost a complete circular range and we can see the where the uh, <laughs> nature takes its place and so very much overgrown but here is a picture of, I'm going to put like a picture here in the video of, of a friend of mine who took a video uh, uh, sorry it took a photo some years ago where it wasn't so overgrown uh, some years ago so whether or not it's the original 1904 is up to debate and so the years um, pass by I'm making my, myself now comfortable here in the shade in this beautiful day um, with lots of sunshine I'm sitting here very comfortably in the uh, gun emplacement and uh, so we were in 1904 uh, talking about the arrival of those Krupp guns whether or not they were here that is a up to debate if whether or not they were here it's just debatable whether or not th this concrete that I'm sitting on is original from 1904 it could be from the 1920s uh, so we were in 1904 and uh, 1909 um, the, the garrison received a very welcome news the gunboat Rio Lima was um, on its last uh, on the la last trip came to Macau um, to fulfill the, the mission of staying here as a naval station uh, as a sovereignty mission we could, could, could call it there was whenever a Portuguese Navy ship would be docked in Macau for some time it would be called the Macau Naval Station and the gunboat Rio Lima was one of those um, and on its last uh, mission was here in Macau where it remained for some years um, but it was a very old it was already from the as a gunboat from the 1870s so thoroughly obsolete by the early uh, 20th century and uh, luckily for the for the for the garrison here in Macau um, the authorities in Portugal the colonies um, uh, ministry allowed for the colonial office allowed and in this case is also the marine office that was responsible there was, it was a joint administration they allowed for the gunboat and whatever was on board to be um, in the benefit of the government of Macau therefore the government in Macau would uh, scrap it and in, in, in mostly what they were looking for was to sell the, 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 the ship and so in 1909 the gunboat was accordingly disarmed and put up to sail the armament that was on board was transferred to the garrison um, uh, for example, and I'm going to go through the several uh, weapons that were on board. There were Nordenfeld uh, machine guns uh, in in the gunboat. Uh, the old type of machine gun is not an automatic. It's just the first iterances of, um, auto, of machine guns. So it was still you had to crank one by one the lever to to shoot, but it could shoot multiple shots. Uh, but it was a very rudimentary uh, technology. In, if we consider the uh, the world of machine guns um, that was transferred to the to the to the Capitania dos Portos so the the local patrol maritime patrol police um, they were also transferred to, to the Macau uh, government two uh, Hotchkiss uh, nine-pounders 
um, uh, uh, guns that were uh, maritime and actually and this is a very interesting part is that um, they one of them is, is still here in Macau the uh, in the security forces museum um, uh, it's actually still here so this these two guns were in 1909 immediately transferred to the Mongha uh, Mongha fortress um, but the gunboat had three medium caliber guns on board. It had one group uh, Rink cannon, 15 centimeter uh, Rink cannon, uh, medium caliber gun, and it had a two 10 centimeters Armstrong Woolwich um, guns on board. And they were quick firing. And uh, the the medium the three medium caliber guns, the Krupp and the Armstrongs, were put into storage. Um, unlike the Hotchkiss nine-pounders, they were immediately positioned in the Mongha Hill. So what then uh, uh, happened uh, was that these medium caliber guns were put into storage um, for roughly <laughs> a year or two. And, that, and because they only remain in storage for a little time is because a uh, very interesting, very forward-looking uh, individual, in that case, the interim governor, uh, Alvor Mel Mashab. Um, and this is going to be a part that is very, very interesting. Um, Alvor Mel Mashab was the uh, chief of staff of uh, the previous governor, Eduardo August Marx. Remember him from 1899? So he was here at that time and he stepped down in uh, after the proclamation of the Portuguese Republic. Uh, Eduardo August Marx was a, a supporter of the monarchy and through pressure he, uh, for, he, he did not support the, revo the Republican Revolution in Portugal and so he stepped down. Um, but it is clear that these conversations of what Eduardo Augusto Marx was thinking passed on to his chief of staff, Alvar Mel Machado. Because Alvar Mel Machado, very soon after, in 1911, produced a very interesting report in which he recommended that um, he, he follow exactly the same thinking that Eduardo August Marx. So it's clear that this conversation happens between the governor and the chief of staff is where to put these um, three guns that came from the Rio Lima gunboat. Uh, Alvaro Mel Machado then pressured his, uh, his officers, namely more, more in the artillery, to find a place for to put these um, these uh, these gun uh, you know, to create to build gun emplacements where to put the uh, a place where to put these uh, these guns. He argued that it is tr and he put it lays out in his report. It is true that there's not that much ammunition available, but. He, he, he then points out that we just can simply order a bit more ammunition to Armstrong and to, uh, to the Krupp manufacturers to bring in more ammunition. And the solution, we, we just need to find, and he puts it puts in like that, we just need to find a solution of where to put them. And lo and behold, the suggestion that, that it is in the end decided is to put the three guns, the one Krupp gun and the two Armstrong guns, also in the gear hill. So in complement to these two gun emplacements that were already existing back then. Uh, and these, uh, Mel, Mel Machado then really is adamant in, in, in putting some resources into it. And so the uh, the gun emplacements that were built uh, in afterwards, so uh, starting in 1912 and all the way to 1914, were um, 
these are uh, fortifications that we can no longer see. And that stands to my reasoning of whether or not those fortifications from 1904 remain the same, because these fortifications that were built in 19, between 1912 and 1914 were demolished, and in the 1920s there were newer, more, more modern fortifications built on top of it. So we cannot see today, here in the Gia Hill, we cannot see any signs of these fortifications. But there are older drawings. For example, this is the drawing of the uh, Krupp, so the, 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 the gun emplacement that was built for. These are the drawings for, the, for that gun emplacement. And actually, this is a very interesting picture of the artillery soldiers carrying the, the gun to its mountings, or to its gun emplacement, um, going up here, going up here in the Gia Hill. Um, but then there's also the uh, Gia, here in the Gia Hill, also the uh, battery created for the two uh, Armstrong, uh, 10 centimeters Armstrong guns. And here is the, uh, the, the, that, the drawings for that specific fortification, which we cannot see anymore here in the Gia Hill. So it has been demolished and something else has been built on top of it. And so I want to go back to this map of 1921. So, and this is the arguable, very, uh, the, something that I have to stress is the difficulty in ascertaining where these uh, two fortifications that, we, uh, that the drawings exist, but it's uncertain where they were because in a later map of 1921, in this map of 1921, we can see all of the Gia Hill. However, it, does, it only gives us the locations of the two original 1904 um, uh, guns because it's those circular features that we can see in the map are those older guns that have a 300 degree horizontal angle of fire. So, because we cannot see in this map where the others are, and it's difficult to, because there's a report also in 1922 that refers to the Krupp, this, this gun emplacement, as a location that is fora de mão. Uh, in, in a way, it's a Portuguese expression that, uh, so the, the officer uses a Portuguese expression that uh, you refer to something as fora de mão, it's literally out of hand, in which it's a location where you need to make a big detour to reach there. So it remains up, to, to, up for debate on whether, where actually this gun emplacement was. Um, he simply refers that fora de mão. So it's difficult to ascertain the true location of these fortifications. They were here in the Gia Hill, however, where they were actually, you know, its precise location, it's very difficult to ascertain from contemporary maps. So these batteries uh, later received uh, honorary um, uh, names. Uh, these two, uh, the older 1904 Krupp, um, uh, 15 centimeter guns received this battery received the name of Batria Comandante Sacadura and the uh, the other Krupp uh, gun received uh, the gun emplacement for the Krupp for the other Krupp gun the, with a smaller shorter barrel the uh, uh, 15 centimeter ring, ring cannon L26 the one that we can see in this picture uh, received the name of uh, Gak Koting. So these were the two officers that made the voyage from Portugal, the first air voyage from, um, uh, from Lisbon all the way to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, and to honor the, the, these feet, we're talking about very early into the uh, history of aviation, you know, we're still in the early early 1920s and they managed to do a trip with some hiccups they, they had to change airplane along the way however they've managed to go and make a voyage from lisbon to uh, to 
to, to Brazil and crossed the Atlantic uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a ferry uh, 3D uh, airplane. And in fact, actually, this ferry 3D um, uh, seaplane actually then later came to Macau by coincidence. And so, but early, but actually before that, these, uh, the, these batteries here were already named in their honor. Uh, the other, the uh, battery, the tens, the, they had a two 10 centimeter Armstrong guns. It received the name of Batteria 5 de Outubro. So that's the Republican, uh, 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 in honor of the Portuguese Republic, which was established on the 5th of October, 1910. So Cinco de Outubro is 5th of October. So the 5th of October battery. Um, Mel Machado, uh, uh, in his report in 1912, already talks about that there, in the, here in the Gear Hill, there are already um, some facilities that are underground because he, he specifies in the Portuguese, he calls it Abrigo Subterraneo. Now, this is very important because the name Abrigo implies that it is a heavily fortified position. Um, so, it, abrigo means literally means shelter, in 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 and in, in, in it specifies it is underground shelter. So, some facilities in the Gear Hill were already um, some facilities here in the Gear Hill were already underground. However, again, just like in the location of these batteries. Given how, how extensive and profound the changes were made here in the 1920s, it's very difficult to ascertain what and what wasn't underground at that time. So, <laughs> go figure. So, I hope you enjoyed watching. We've reached the end of the video. Um, about the Mill Gear Hill e around the turn of the 20, uh, from the 19th century to the 20th century and the very, very early beginning of the 20th century. Uh, this is a video, the, the first part. So there are going to be three videos about, about the military history of the Gear Hill in the 20th century. And I will be providing the link in the description box down below of the other two videos once they are published. Um, I thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed um, watching it as much as uh, is, I feel very uh, happy in, in uh, recording it and shooting it and, and making it available um, for everyone. So hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching.